Call it a going away present. Office culture found its comeuppance in the movies of 1999. While the late 80s portrayed the American office job as sexy and exciting in films like Wall Street and Working Girl, the late 90s dwelled on the drudgery of the cubicle. Office Space, Fight Club, The Matrix, American Beauty, these were movies about feeling like your life had reached a dead end, that every day was the same boring slog, and that pursuing the typical measures of success had left its heroes alienated, unfulfilled, and increasingly miserable. You want me to deprioritize my current reports yeah. until you advise of a status upgrade? Make these your primary action items. You have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. Obviously, you are mistaken. Ever since I started working, um, every single day of my life has been worse than the day before it. So that means that every single day that you see me, that's on the worst day of my life. Wow, that's messed up. Part of what was so interesting about this trend were the different genres it encompassed. Sci-fi action, satirical comedy, prestige drama, postmodern existentialism, mind-bending thriller. All of these vastly different styles found their own way to address the same theme, the soul-crushing complacency of the middle-class office job. I'm far from the first person to make this observation. Many of the filmmakers behind these movies have noted the similarities. Brian Raftery discusses it in his book on the best films of 1999. And YouTube's own Now You See It referred to the phenomenon as, quote, the year of the cubicle movie. This little subgenre finds its best moniker in an essay from scholar Hunter Latham, entitled The Celluloid Cubicle. But something occurs to me when I look at all these movies together. For all the darkness and cynicism, most of these movies strive for identification, affirmation, and hope, at least to an extent. Despite miserable, self-destructive behavior, and despite none of these films offering any notion that corporate culture could be fixed, these are stories where the heroes ultimately achieve some catharsis and a measure of self-acceptance. Trust me. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> I'm great. Fucking A. You met me at a very strange time in my life. But in the midst of this self-actualization, one film stands apart. Being John Malkovich. Often cited among the year's office films, but rarely analyzed from this perspective to the same extent. Perhaps that's because in a movie so dense with philosophical musings on the nature of the mind and the self, satire of the 9-to-5 office gig feels like small potatoes. There is indeed a lot going on in this movie. Malkovich! Malkovich. But I think it's essential to place being John Malkovich within the celluloid cubicle of 1999, as it is simultaneously one of the most biting of corporate culture while still condemning its hapless protagonist. Of all 1999's Office movies, this is the only one where the protagonist ends up worse than he was at the start of the story. Spoilers incoming, but rather than overcome his soul-crushing existence, Craig Schwartz's mind becomes trapped in the body of a little girl destined to write out existence as a passive observer. Maxine. Maxine. Huh? I love you, Maxine. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Perhaps we should take a step back and talk about how Craig got here in the first place. Craig Schwartz is a nebbish loser who lives in a small New York City apartment with his wife Lottie and her strange collection of pets. Unable to find stable work as a puppeteer, you motherfucker! Craig gets a job in an office building working on the seven and a half floor as a file entry clerk for Lester Corp. In the office, 
Craig finds a portal that allows one to enter the mind of acclaimed character actor John Malkovich. You see the world through John Malkovich's eyes, and then after about 15 minutes, you're spit out into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey Turnpike. Craig and Maxine, a woman who works in the same office, decide to sell the experience as a chance to be someone else, while they, Lottie, and Malkovich himself enter a strange love square. Eventually, Craig learns how to control Malkovich well inside, and begins to live as Malkovich, taking Maxine as a lover, and finally succeeding in his puppetry. But then, plot twist, it turns out that the portal into Malkovich was part of a cult by Craig's boss, Lester, who uses these portals and person hopping to live forever. After some complex scheming, Craig is coaxed out of Malkovich so Lester and his homies can enter, Lottie and Maxine run off to be lovers and parents, and Craig tries to re-enter Malkovich, but is too late, and instead becomes trapped in the next vessel, Emily, Maxine and Lottie's daughter, conceived when Lottie took over Malkovich and had sex with Maxine. Like I said, there's a lot going on here. I didn't even mention the monkey flashback. <laughs> But despite the overwhelming strangeness, recurrent tropes clearly align being John Malkovich with the other Office movies of 1999. Craig Schwartz is yet another disaffected white dude enduring the drudgery of Office culture. He's alienated, unfulfilled, and bitter at a world that doesn't satisfy him. His Manhattan office job is not only comparable to the cubicles of 1999, it might actually be worse. Craig's job doesn't just weigh him down metaphorically, but literally, the low ceilings forcing Craig to bend and contort himself to fit within the space. Bosses in Fight Club and The Matrix were confrontational assholes, but Craig's boss is so bizarre and disquieting that conversations border on the surreal thick with social awkwardness. I don't want to be your goddamn link, damn ya. I want to feel Flores's naked thighs next to mine. I want my body to inspire lust in that beautiful, complex woman. American Beauty showed Lester's alienation at work through framing and blocking, but Craig's co-workers literally don't understand him. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have no idea what you're saying to me right now. My name is Schwartz. My name is Schwartz. Another key aspect of the Cubicle movie is the protagonist's general feelings of uselessness. That their work doesn't actually contribute anything of value to the world. And while that feeling is all over the celluloid cubicle, it is most pronounced in being John Malkovich. Say what you will about these other jobs, but I at least know what function they serve. Peter worked in IT, Neo was a programmer for a software company, the narrator handled insurance claims, and Lester wrote for a magazine. In all cases, it's clear what the job actually produces. But what does Lester Corp do? I know Craig is hired as a file clerk, but what is he filing? Why? Lester is a doctor. Is this supposed to be some sort of medical practice? Or maybe psychiatric? It's not really clear, and on a plot level, it doesn't really matter. It just needed to be an office job. But the vagary of the work is significant thematically, as it further contributes to the hollowness of the office job, as depicted in 1999. It's not just that the job sucks, but that the job seems so utterly pointless. Thing is, for Craig, the bullshit job is just one more area for feelings of inadequacy to fester. That's another aspect that unites these movies. Each roots their portrait of office drudgery within a greater theme of insecure masculinity. You're not somebody I could get interested in, Craig. You play with dolls. This is most overt in Fight Club, with repeated references to literal and figurative manhood, but it's found across all of these films each concerned with a cis-straight white man at some level of middle class who feels disempowered in his life. Granted, I should quickly note that The Matrix throws a bit of a wrench into this, first because actor Keanu Reeves is actually biracial and not strictly white, 
and second, because The Matrix is written and directed by two trans women who've recently been open about the film being a deliberate allegory for trans experience. So describing Neo's story as simply that of a cis white guy is not entirely fair, but it is reflective of the film's internal reality. Keanu Reeves may be biracial, but I don't think we're meant to read Neo as such. The name Tom Anderson feels almost deliberately chosen for its suggested whiteness, as evidenced by famous Tom Andersons, the MySpace founder, the Scottish fiddler, and the key supporting character in Beavis and Butthead to America. Hey, wait a minute. You two look kind of familiar. Ain't you them kids that have been whacking off in my tool shed? <laughs> Similarly, while trans readings of the Matrix are valid and rewarding, they still exist at a subtextual level. Within the diegesis, Neo is presented as a cis man, and therefore I think analyzing the film with that mindset is fair. And indeed, Neo fits in quite well with fellow tech employee Peter Gibbons and the rest of 1999's Cubicle Zombies. These are men whose unfulfilled potential and alienation at work reflected a greater crisis in American masculinity. Men who no longer felt like real men. Oh, and I have to piss sitting down like a goddamn girly girl. The disaffection felt from a hated job that produced nothing of value carried into a home life of sexual frustration. You can draw a pretty clear line dividing the cubicle movie protagonists in two groups. The lonely single guys whose own sexual shortcomings are inferred by the text. I don't know, sometimes I get the feeling like she's cheating on me. Yeah, I get that feeling too, man and husbands who resented their chaste relationships to their wives. Craig falls into the second group, his home life a mess of roaming animals and his marriage completely lacking in passion. It's also significant that, despite making pennies puppeteering in the streets, Craig and Lottie are able to afford a modest New York apartment. It's never stated outright, but the implication is Lottie is the one who pays for it further undercutting Craig's masculinity by demonstrating his failure as an earner. The link between demoralizing office gig and wounded masculinity is further reinforced by how one influences the other in these movies. Simply put, reclamation of masculinity is symbiotic with rebellion against the cubicle. Peter stops caring about his job, and shortly after finds the confidence to ask out his crush and re-energize his sex life. Neo takes a red pill out of office culture and is transformed from a shy nerd into a badass action hero. The narrator reasserts his masculinity with basement brawls and fight club and shows up at the office with the confrontational attitude to prove it. Lester tells his boss to go fuck himself and then tells his wife the same. And Craig, well, we'll get to Craig in a minute. The point is, in these movies, reclamation of manhood and workplace rebellion go hand in hand and it feels good. It's gratifying to see the narrator snarl blood in a meeting, or when Lester stops being such a doormat, or watch Neo kick the ass of a villain who looks suspiciously like his boss. At least, I think it is. We are meant to like these guys, right? Neo and Peter, certainly. They're both the prototypical put upon every man, meant to elicit sympathy and identification. Lester and the narrator are a bit thornier, but they too are meant to be relatable. Project Mayhem may quickly evolve into something horrific, but the narrator's frustrations at his unfulfilling job, utter loneliness, and the hollow materialism that dominates his life are valid grievances that tap into legitimate anxieties. Lester's perverted attraction to a high schooler is certainly not great, but I do think the film is acutely aware of this and positions that attraction as predatory. Furthermore, like the narrator, many of Lester's frustrations stem from legitimate pains, while a lot of the humorous ways Lester rebels and reasserts himself are so comical, they become endearing. While both Fight Club and American Beauty are critical of their protagonists, they also still present these characters as likable even down to giving each a key moment of redemption. And that decision is relevant, as it is not one being John Malkovich makes. To be blunt, Craig Schwartz is a reprehensible person. 
He is a feckless coward who stays in a marriage he has no passion for while immediately lusting after the first hot woman he sees, despite her repeated rejections. He holds the pretensions of a tortured artist who wants to see the world through the eyes of another. You see, it's the idea of being inside someone else's skin and, and seeing what they see and feeling what they feel. But all he really cares about is his own gratification. Whether it's sponging off a woman he doesn't love because she pays the rent, or using Malkovich as a vessel for his own art, Craig is constantly manipulating others to get what he wants. Hell, that line about experiencing the world through another perspective is really just a rehearsed come on to try and get into Maxine's pants. Would you like to be inside my skin? More than anything, Maxine. And he only gets worse with time, hitting his low point by locking his wife in a monkey cage for several days so he can enter Malkovich and have sex with Maxine. Crucial here is that Maxine thinks it's Lottie and Malkovich. Lines of consent can be confusing when we're talking about brain control, but going by the movie's logic of wearing John Malkovich like a suit, I think this qualifies as rape. I did it! I made him move his arm across your girlfriend's glorious tit! Like I said, reprehensible. To an extent, you can make similar criticisms of the other cubicle movie protagonists, especially Lester and the narrator. Both can also be cruelly misogynistic and are very self-centered, but there are some key differences too. First and foremost, the things Craig does are way worse than anything Lester or the narrator do. Second, Craig never has any real moment of remorse or redemption. The closest is probably when he agrees to leave Malkovich when he thinks Maxine is being held hostage, but even this he does very reluctantly. Third, and maybe most crucial, director Spike Jones and writer Charlie Kaufman are under no illusions that their lead is any sort of nice guy. Quite the contrary, being John Malkovich is largely centered on Craig's cruelty and the pain he causes others. The key piece of evidence comes after Lottie has been inside Malkovich and confides to Craig that she thinks she might be transgender. As is customary for 90s movies, Craig initially expresses disgust and dismissal, but Jones's camera stays with Lottie, emphasizing her pain in being so callously disregarded by her husband. Why do you always yell at me? Sorry, I'm sorry. The film's empathy lies not with Craig and his transphobia, but with Lottie. And there are several smaller moments like this littered through being John Malkovich. Moments where the film picks up on and identifies the pain Craig causes those around him. There's something karmic then about Craig's fate. After causing so much harm to both Lottie and Maxine, the two decide they're better off without him and become lovers, which Craig is forced to watch while trapped helplessly in the body of a little girl. It doesn't get much more emasculating than that. But I also don't think this ending is quite so simple as a bad man getting what he deserves. Being John Malkovich is not what I'd call a fair movie. If it was, Malkovich's body wouldn't be a vessel for these weirdos to live in. Rather, Craig's end is more simply rooted in character flaws integral to his person. It's not so much that Craig is being punished for his cruelty or selfishness, so much that those traits inevitably bring Craig back to the same spiteful and envious place he started in. With that in mind, let's return to the other Cubicle movies of 1999. While the rebellion against office culture in the celluloid cubicle is fun to watch, its freedoms are also fleeting. Peter's hypnosis-induced zen might give him a happier disposition, but a positive state of mind can't fix the office, nor can the narrator refusing to wear a tie or Lester calling his bosses assholes. Escape is the only answer. It's only once the hero sheds his chains in the office that he is able to fulfill himself and find happiness. What that actually looks like is different from film to film. Office Space sees Peter reclaim his masculinity by working a blue-collar construction gig, while following the trans allegory, The Matrix sees Neo fully shed his dead name and find peace, not in being told he's the one, 
but in choosing that path for himself. Fight Club's narrator at first descends further into violent, toxic masculinity after quitting his job, but eventually finds catharsis in destroying Tyler Durden and the machismo ideals he represents. Only then is the narrator able to allow himself emotional openness and vulnerability with Marla. Lester's piece is the most bittersweet, given he is soon after killed, but it's crucial that his awakening does not come from childish performance or nostalgic indulgence, but accepting his role as father and husband. None of these movies are so reductive as to say, once you leave your shitty office job, your life will turn around, but each presents that exodus as a crucial step towards self-actualization. Being John Malkovich asks a different question. What if you do escape from the drudgery of the cubicle, and your life doesn't actually get any better. Because Craig does escape. Through Malkovich, Craig ascends beyond the dreary conditions of his life and gets everything he wanted. Wealth, acclaim, recognition of his art. Hell, he even gets Maxine too. All the riches the world had denied him are finally granted. And through it all, he's still just Craig the same cruel, manipulative, selfish person he always was. And just as Malkovich starts to physically resemble Craig, so too does Craig's life begin to revert to how it used to be, with Maxine growing to once again despise Craig. His new marriage becomes as sexless as the old. His general unpleasantness once again wins him a beating from a stranger. And in the final scene, Craig is bitterly looking at someone else's happiness, wishing it were his. Just like at the beginning of the movie. He may have left Lester Corp, but many of the root causes of Craig's unhappiness are too deeply embedded within the self to be so easily abandoned with the cubicle. Which is not to say corporate culture is spared in Jones or Kaufman's vision. To reiterate my earlier points, the drudgery of the office is perhaps at its most alienating and uncomfortable in being John Malkovich. But identifying with Craig is far more painful than with other office protagonists, which is what makes the film such an essential text of the celluloid cubicle. All of these movies invite the spectator to see themselves in their hero's conflict. The nameless narrator of Fight Club allows men to substitute themselves in his place, while he and Peter both espouse how their struggles are those of all men. Neo is a put-upon everyman whose ensuing adventure offers vicarious fantasy. Lester's voiceover directly addresses the viewer on personal, even friendly terms. For these men to succeed is to serve as a comfort, a reassurance to a viewer facing similar problems. Being John Malkovich offers the same relatability and is just as thorough in eviscerating office culture, while simultaneously turning its criticisms toward the protagonist, outlining the entitlement and misogyny which often underline crises of masculinity. These elements are present throughout the celluloid cubicle, and while other films in the movement do address these pernicious attitudes, only being John Malkovich brings those attitudes to their most reprehensible extremes. In doing so, the film goes beyond office culture and suggests a simpler, more painful notion. Maybe unhappiness is rooted deeper than just a crappy job.